Hi, everyone. We're picking up on our last episode about Jesus' words only is the true new covenant canon. This will be episode three. This is taking the first chapter of Jesus' words only and doing a little deeper dive now on issues that may impact how to determine what is canon. And of course, if we can prove what the earliest Christian canon was, wouldn't that be the best evidence? Of course, yes, it would. So we're looking at something that uh, I stumbled across just in trying to dig this up. And it was Eusebius's work in Syriac. In other words, it's it's the church history that did not, uh, how can I put it? Somebody deletes it from the Latin, but it's there in the Syriac. And this uh, community at Edessa, a monastery, had it all the way into the uh, 1840s. And that's how it was looked at. And it's actually a document from the 300s, which is reflecting back on a time period when it was from the 100s. And so the church of Edessa was founded in the 100s. So anyway, the subtitle here is Eusebius in his work on the doctrine of the apostles. That's the name of the work that has been recovered by uh, Dr. Curatone. And he was a person who worked at the British Museum and a good Christian person. Uh, He recovered this in the 1840s and he did a translation. So this is part two of that, uh, although it's episode three of the overall topic of Jesus words only chapter one. Okay. So what's significant about this is Paul's death is the only mention of Paul. And that's very significant because I'm going to walk you through, listen to the summary of this early church. And you'll, you'll wonder why is Paul never mentioned doing any ministry in all the different areas that he himself is recorded in the book of Acts of having been involved in, but he's, he's, he's obliterated. He's not mentioned at all. So that's a very intriguing possibility of what is about, what that's about. And I'll provide an answer at the end. But let's take a look at it. So first of all, Edessa, this is a city in Mesopotamia. Basically, it's it's still part of uh, Turkey today, but it's kind of <laughs> overlaps near Iraq, to modern Iraq, and that's Mesopotamia. So it's a uh, Christianity, though, came to that city, Edessa, in that early time period of the 100s. Second century means the 100s. Now, uh, what I did last time, I showed you that the work that's in Syriac, meaning a dialect of Aramaic Hebrew, and that means it's very close to what Jesus would have spoken. And it's uh, when it's recreated, when it's translated by uh, this gentleman, Curatone, and then Mr. Wright helps later, it's entitled From the History of the Church, and it's going to be called The Doctrine of the Apostles. Now, I want to make a point here that this quote I'm going to show you, which is telling you what is the legitimate canon that can be read from the pulpit, from the, from the front of the room to the people and t- tell them this is the word of God, right? What is that going to be? Well, you'll see, I can now date you when this was created. This is actually created, I believe, this principle 10 of the apostles prior to what? To John writing the book of Revelation and John writing the book of John because both are not even mentioned here. So listen to this. The apostles appointed that, except the Old Testament, the law, and the prophets, and the gospel. So it's talking about one gospel, and the Hebrew gospel of Matthew is all that likely can be talking about, because that was very well accepted as what they were looking at, the early church, and the acts of their own triumphs. So let's, just for argument's sake, accept that that could be even the book of Acts, because it's a great book for us to use to examine and test Paul with. Let not anything be read on the pulpit of the church. So other than the law, the prophets, the gospel, Hebrew, Matthew, and the book of Acts of their triumphs, or I think it's probably meant the Clementine homilies, but, you know, it's an argument. Let not anything be read on the pulpit of the church. What's missing? All the epistles. It doesn't matter if it's James or Peter or whatever. Those are not on par with the words of Christ. Christ is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. That's in Acts chapter 3. That's important for us to know who Jesus really is. And that's why I do like Acts of the Apostles being considered part of Scripture. So part of Holy Scripture in the sense that it's informative. It's really just a history brief for a trial that's upcoming with Paul. But it's a great source of information on what the true apostles had said. And that's in Revelation 3, 21, 23, about Peter calling Jesus the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, a very important fact. So what's missing is the book of Revelation, the book of John. And so what does that mean? This principle was adopted before the book of Revelation, the book of John. The book of Revelation is written in 67 AD. 
and there was a mistake about something about a mention of Domitian, and they thought it was Domitian the emperor instead it meant Dominus, and it was talking about Dominus Nero, and somebody came up with this bright idea that had to be Domitian's reign, and they can't put that off into the 90s. No, the book Revelation, according to uh, Mr. Young, the author of the Young's Literal uh, uh, Young's Literal uh, New Testament, he said that's what that was. It was a mistake. It was some, somebody just simply didn't know how to read the Latin correctly, and they thought it meant Domitian instead of Dominus Nero, and that's all it was. So that's in 67 AD is the book of Revelation, and that's two years after Paul's dead, just so you know. And then John is written in 96 AD with Papias, it says Eminuensis, meaning his scribe, and he dictates to him, and then he prepares what we see today is the book of John. Those two books are not even referenced here, is it? are they? So this tells you the work we're looking at, the doctrine of the apostles, that Eusebius is preserving for history. Remember, he's the he's the bishop of Caesarea. This is an area where the uh, the Ebonite church located the, the gospel of Matthew to the Hebrews and put it in the library of Caesarea. And it, it was a private collection and people could go look at it, examine it, could translate from it, but could never remove it. So it was a permanently protected work. At least that was the effort they were making to protect it. So I think you can actually date the, the work we're looking at, the Doctrine of the Apostles, to that date. So that was what we talked about last time. I didn't get into the dating until just now, so this is new. Now, I talked about last time that there's a break where you can see the difference between this principle. See, they're, they're numbered 10 over here on the left, X. That is principle 10. Principle 27 is how it ends. And the... What is what Eusebius is doing is quoting, and again the apostles appointed. So he's quoting them and then saying what they said that the bread of oblation should be placed upon the altar on the day that it is baked. So he's talking about the uh, communion. Okay, so this is the um, where they're making principles and statements to be followed. And again, when is it? This is before the book of Revelation is written, before the Gospel of John. Now it stops, and then it goes into, but all these things, it was not for themselves, that the apostles appointed them, but for those who should come after them. That sounds exactly like something somebody would say centuries later, that this is these principles I just quoted you, you see, this is saying, these principles were to be carried on for the generations after these guys. <laughs> so that's how I would break it up. But what's very interesting, now we're going to read this second section, which is presumably Eusebius uh, interpreting what from maybe some documents he doesn't say he's no longer quoting a source like he was doing up to this time now he is literally telling you the story and watch how he tells the story where paul is omitted from any mention until the very last paragraph line his death and i'm going to get into that in a second so i would say the answer is that this is the the end of this right here between these this paragraph of 27 and then but all these things that's where the original text ends of the the uh, the teaching the doctrine of the apostles, and then this is, I would say, Eusebius's interpretation as an historian of what it all means, and he does go into some details, and presumably he's getting them from other sources, or maybe he's condensing them like good historians do. So let's take a look at this. This is what he says, beginning of page thirty-three of the book. And again, what book am I referring to? It's this book to the left. Now, as I did with the prior episode, I put a uh, link to a URL to my Airtable, and you can easily download the PDF to your computer of this amazing document. It's an important historical document of Christianity that has been overlooked, I believe. Uh, and it's in this book entitled Ancient Syriac Documents Relative to the Earliest Establishment of Christianity in Edessa. That's that town I told you in Mesopotamia. It's uh, in, cl clearly, it's in modern Turkey, but it's uh, a city that had a long history of Christianity beginning in the early 100s. And the neighboring countries from the year after our Lord's ascension to the beginning of the 4th century, discovered, edited, translated, and annotated by the late William Curaton, Dr. Divinity, Canon of Westminster. That means he's very close to <laughs> the, uh, the, the monarchy. He's a member of the Imperial Institute of France and so on. And he was much more than that. He was a, a, a prelate, if you will, a, a, probably an Anglican priest. He'd taken orders. So he's, a, he's a, a person of strong Christian convictions as well. 
Uh, the preface was by William Wright, PhD, LLD. He's an assistant in the Department of the Manuscripts of the British Museum, and that's exactly where Curatum was working. He was a manuscript curator himself, and he was doing the translations from it. And this work is from 1864. Again, you can download this PDF easily from the link I'll put in the description, and it's also in the last video. Now let's read, page 33. And by the hand of priesthood, which the apostles themselves had received from our Lord, their gospel was spread abroad in the four quarters of the world rapidly. And while they visited one another, they ministered to each other. Jerusalem received the hand of priesthood and all the country of Palestine and the parts of the Samaritans of the Philistines and the country of the Arabians of Phoenicia and the people of Caesarea. That's where he is a bishop, right? From whom? James, who was ruler and guide in the church of the apostles, who which had been built in Zion. Okay, so who better than him to know who was the uh, bishop of that region, Caesarea, that was encompassed within the jurisdiction of James. Next, the great Alexandria and Thebius and the whole of inner G Egypt and all the country of Pelusium and even the borders of the Indians received the apostles' hand of priesthood from Mark, the evangelist, meaning the person who wrote the gospel of Mark, who was ruler and guide there in the church which he had built there and ministered. India and all of its own countries and those bordering on it, even to the farthest sea, received the apostles' hand of priesthood from Judas Thomas. That's, that's the uh, Apostle Thomas, who was guide and ruler in the church which he built there and ministered there. Antioch and Syria and Cilicia and Galatia, even to Pontus, received the Apostle's hand of priesthood. Don't look, don't look. Who do you think this should be? Didn't Paul come from Antioch? Didn't he go to Damascus in Syria? Didn't he go to Galatia? Okay, but look who it is. Who is received the apostle's hand of priesthood from Simon Kephas, that is Simon Peter, who himself laid the foundation of the church there and was priest and ministered there up to the time when he went up from thence to Rome on account of Simon the sorcerer, who was deceiving the people of Rome by his sorceries. Now, just so you know, in the uh, late 300s, the uh, story came out or claim was that every time uh, you wanted to change the name of Paul inside of the Clementine homilies, they would always blame Simon the Sorcerer, Simon Magus. And it could very well be that what we're looking at, even though it was written in around 315 AD, the same thing is going on here, <laughs> is that this is should be replaced with back to where it was, was Paul, on account of Paul, who was deceiving the people of Rome by his sorceries. Okay, so you're going to say that can't possibly be, right? Okay. Well, pay attention to where Paul fits in any of this description that you're going to get, and you would see it would fit exactly the entire context until you get to the end, which is another, I believe, probably late 300s, has to be, you'll see why, change, which is the death of Paul, as we'll see. The city, now we're going to go continuing. The city of Rome and all Italy and Spain and Britain and Gaul, together with the other remaining countries which bordered on them. Now stop there. This could be Paul, right? Because didn't Paul write a letter to Rome and didn't he travel to Spain after he uh, left Rome? That's in uh, Clement's, uh, the first, the epistle, first Clement epistle, chapter five. He goes to the extremity of the, the west of the Roman Empire, which is Spain. And um, now Britain, that's a different thing. But anyway, uh, and Gaul, France, and with the other remaining countries which bordered on them, received the apostles' hand of priesthood from whom? Simon Kephas. So no collaboration with Paul there, who went up from Antioch. That's where Paul started his first experience in Christianity. After years, 14 years in Arabia, he comes back and he's suddenly at Antioch. But apparently that's not the place where Paul's influence is even counted at all. It comes from Simon Kephas, Simon Peter and became ruler and guide there in the church, which he built there and in its, its environs. Ephesus and Thessalonica and all Asia. Now this should clearly be Paul, right? He went to Thessalonica. He went to Ephesus. He was all over Asia Minor. Asia Minor, by the way, is not China. Asia Minor is a province of Rome. It's in the region of Ephesus, and it covers that area to the western part of Turkey, and that region then on the other side of the Aegean Sea would be Greece. So that gives you some perspective. 
and all the country of the Corinthians. Now, again, I would assume this should be Paul if he's so influential. And all of Achaia and its environs received the apostles' hand of the priesthood from John the Evangelist, who had learnt, leaned upon the bos bosom of our Lord, who built a church there and ministered there in his office guide there. Now, I'm going to pause there. Now, do you see something's changed from the, the 27 principles earlier where there was just the gospel, a single gospel, and the book of Acts, and besides the law and prophets? Now you have John the Evangelist is now come on the scene, and he is preached clearly in Ephesus and Asia because they're mentioned in the book of Revelation. Okay, and so that's, and when he leaves Patmos, eventually he's released, he's released into Ephesus, and he becomes very influential in Asia, and that's where the scholars call it the eclipse of, P, of Paul because he's never mentioned for almost 100 years. It's very late into the one late 100s, probably around 170, 180, when he's first mentioned again other than the epistle of Clement. And literally, the Justin Martyr doesn't even mention Paul once with numerous books. I mean, we're talking lots and lots of books and lots and lots of pages, not one mention of him and not one quote of him. It's hard to understand how that could happen. And he fills most of that gap. He's the main writer until Arrhenius shows up in the late 100s. But I digress. So John the Evangelist is the one who teaches of the Ephesians, the Thessalonians, the people of Asia Minor, there in the, the Corinthians, the gospel. Wow. I, I mean, this is a very big deal that this doesn't say anything about Paul. Who had leaned upon the bosom of the Lord, who built a church there and ministered there in his office of guide there. Nicaea and Nicomedia. Nicaea is where they're going to have a conference later. This hasn't happened yet, apparently, in the, when he's writing this. Uh, and Nicomedia and all the country of Bithynia and of the Gatia and the regions of round about it, received the apostles' hand of priesthood from Andrew, the brother of Simon Kephas, Simon Peter, who was guide and ruler in the church which he, she built there and was priest and ministered there. Byzantium and all the country of Thrace and its environs, even to the great river, the border which separates between the barbarians, received the apostles' hand of priesthood from Luke, the apostle. Now, don't get shocked. The word apostle in Greek or in Aramaic, would be, simply mean messenger. It does not necessarily mean you're an apostle. So I think the person who wrote this is Eusebius, and he knows the difference. So he's not thinking that these people are an apostle, but people capitalize it. This is this is people later in time, Curitan, just simply capitalizing something without really saying why he's doing that. So he's added something to it. And maybe because it's not used in the same sense as the word apostle by Jesus. He said, yeah, you're my 12 apostles. And we see in the book of Revelation, there's only 12 foundation stones for the New Jerusalem. Probably the right thing to do here is go the messenger to indicate to people the word apostle not does not necessarily have a legal connotation when it's regarding Luke or Lucius is his actual Latin name. Anyway, I'll go with it, though. I'm not going to fight with it. I just want you to know that's probably uh, an issue I would correct if I were the author of this. But let's let Mr. Curidon speak. Luke, the apostle who built a church there and ministered there in his office of ruler and guide there. So isn't that interesting? Luke was still involved in the church in a great manner. But is he working with Paul here? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Edessa now, that's the city where all these works are found. Edessa and all its environs, which are were on all sides of it, and Soba and Arabia and all the north and the regions around about it and the south and all the places of the borders of Mesopotamia received the apostle's hand of priesthood from Adeas, the apostle or messenger, one of the 72 apostles or disciples or messengers who taught there and built a church there and was priest and ministered there in his office of guide there. Next, the whole of Persia and Assyrians and Armenians and Medians, Medians and of the countries around about Babylon, the Husites and the Gelai, even to the borders of the Indians, I think it means the nation of India, and even to the country of Gog and Magog and all the countries from all sides received the apostles' hand of priesthood from Agias, a maker of golden chains, the disciple of Adias, the apostle or the messenger. But the rest of the other fellows of the apostles went to the distant countries of the barbarians, asked on, and there they ministered with their preaching. There also was their departure out of this world, while their disciples after them continued to go on up to the present day. 
and there was no change or addition made by them to what they preached. So the gospel doesn't change. Notice that. Now, next. But Luke, the evangelist, meaning the person who wrote a gospel, had this diligence and wrote the triumphs of the Acts of the Apostles. So there that is clearly talking about the Acts of the Apostles by Luke and the ordinances and laws of the ministry of their priesthood and whither each one of them went. By his diligence, therefore, Luke wrote these things and more than these, and he placed them in the hand of Priscus and Achilles, his disciples. And they accompanied him every day up to the day of his death. Like as Timothy and Erastus of Lystra and Menaeus, Menaeus, the first disciples of the apostles, accompanied Paul until he went up to the city of Rome because he had withstood the orator Tertullus. Okay, did he call him an apostle? Paul, no. And Nero the emperor slew him, Paul, with the sword and Simon Kephas in the city of Rome. And that's it. It ends here. So all the only mention is here of Paul. Let's see how, what context it is. So the, here's Luke. He's working with Priscus and Achilles up to the day of his death. He dies. Like as Timothy and Erastus of Lystra and Aeneas, the first disciples of the apostles accompanied Paul. So just like Timothy and Erastus accompanied Paul until he went up to the city of Rome, until Paul left and went to the city of Rome because he withstood the orator Tertullus. Again, this is his only role and mention of all the things that you could mention. He, he resisted the orator Tertullus, whoever that is. And Nero the emperor slew him with the sword and Simon Kephas in the city of Rome. Now I'm going to prove to you beyond a shadow of doubt, he was not slain, he was not slain by anybody. He's a citizen of Rome. You can't do that to a citizen of Rome. Nero can't even do it himself, so to speak. And, uh, and anyway, we know who exactly where he died. He died in Spain. And that's because the Bishop of Rome says so. And who would know better than him that he didn't die? Paul did not die. In Rome would be the what? Bishop of Rome. So let's take a look at that. Uh, this is uh, just a mention here of this book by Charles Quarles. He's a professor, a biblical uh, teacher. Uh, in the Illustrated Life of Paul, he mentions that in the epistle of First Clement, it says uh, being Cl uh, Clement is a Roman because he's the Bishop of Rome. He spoke of the farthest limits of the West of where Paul went. He almost certainly had Spain in mind. Well, of course he did because that's where it is. Uh, and just to go to show you, uh, the Schaff Hersock Encyclopedia says First Clement and Paul's Romans, uh, Paul's Roman citizenship. Ship, it's almost incredible that he, Paul, can have been crucified. Well, it's impossible that he could even be killed. That's the problem with this whole idea. He could be, he could be, uh, he couldn't even be scourged. <laughs> he could be exiled. That's the punishment he can give, be given. And if you think about it, exile meant going to a different province than the area around Rome. And if you did that, you could go there, but you can't stay in Rome. And we'll see this clearly. Here's the works of Sallust. He's a Roman uh, historian. And he's talking about uh, some wars that went on and so on. This is volume two, London, 1806. And uh, page 428 of the original work, it mentions in the notes to this work, notes on the history of the Jugurthine War or the conquest of Numidia, by the Valerian Porcian laws, exile was substituted for death as the highest punishment that could be inflicted on a Roman citizen. So if you remember, Paul was a Roman citizen. So could he have been killed by Nero? Absolutely not. And don't get this idea that Nero can violate the law of Rome. No, it's it's a it's a very severe punishment. And the reason why is if you got Roman citizen, it meant you were connected to the the parties that are ruling the empire. So you don't get this just because you're, uh, you know, you bought it. You can't buy it in that sense. I mean, I guess you could pay a lot of money for it if you wanted to. But it meant you were a power broker in the government of Rome. And that meant your family would all get the same privilege. Paul mentions that his relative in Romans 13, 1 is Herodion, meaning little Herod, meaning the son of one of the Herods is his friend at Rome in his addressing his kinsmen. He says, I say, salute my kinsmen. He says this in Romans 13, 1, salute my kinsmen, Herodion at Rome. So he's writing the Roman church and he's saying he has a relative there. His name is Herodion, meaning little Herod. This is a name you're not allowed to use if you're not part of the Herodian family, just so you know. So this is a very clear indication that he had that relative. Also in Acts 13.1, 1, 
Menaean, according to Luke, is a childhood friend, uh, nursemaid, n- nursemate with uh, Herod Antipas, the person who sent Jesus to his death at Pilate's hand, Herod Antipas, and Paul. Saulus, actually, is what he says. Saulus. So Menaean is the childhood friend of Herod Antipas and Saul. So that means these three gentlemen were all friends as children. And that makes sense if Paul's relative is little Herod in Romans 13.1. We would say in Acts 13.1, the same thing happens to be true, that Paul is a childhood friend of Herod Antipas, just as much as Menaean is, because they're all three buddies. And that likely means they're all relatives. How can you be so closely and intimate as you, you'd have a family relationship, or you could be friends? But in this case with Paul, we know it's a relationship he has as a member of the Herodian family. This is not a shocking statement. Now, I just want to mention to you the Valerian laws. How do we know Paul could not have been killed at Rome? First of all, we'll, we'll get into uh, first the Valerian laws, okay? These date to 509, 509 BC. They were proposed by Consul Publius Valerius Publica Cicero, states that this law meant a magistrate could not kill or flog a Roman citizen if no provocatio had been applied. Now, what that means is if the judgment came down and you wanted to kill the person you thought was a death penalty, you could not do that if uh, no provocatio had been applied. Now, I'm going to tell you what that means is, is the death penalty can never be used unless the defendant in the dock appeals a provocatio to the public to make a decision. Should I be punished? <laughs> and only if he does that, the uh, the uh, the person in the dock appeals for a public decision on the justice of the result, the magistrate cannot kill you, cannot order your death if you're, if you're a Roman citizen. Okay, I'm going to show you that in a second right here. Lex Valeria de Provocatione. Provocatio was a method for appealing the decision of a Roman magistrate. Provocatio could occur after a normal trial had been conducted in front of a magistrate with Imperium. After the final judgment, the defendant could call out a provoco. The act of provocatio called upon the protection of the tribuna plebis, that's the, the tribunal of the people, who transferred the power to adjudicate to the Roman people, a iodicum populi. The people could then confirm or reject the magistrate's sentence. So see, so you can't give him, if you're a Roman citizen, as long as you don't appeal to the people, you accept whatever the sentence is, you could not be killed. But if you appeal the decision to the, you do provocatio, you can now be killed if you lose. So that's the only circumstance is, why would you ever appeal to the people of Rome? No, you shouldn't do that. Just accept whatever the sentence is less than death. They can't give you a sentence of death until and unless you make an appeal to, to your whatever the sentence was to the people of Rome. And then you can be killed if, if the judge decides to increase the penalty. So it's, it's a very, it's very obviously you would never appeal a decision at all. Uh, not all judgments are subject to provocatio. It only applied to the power of a coercitio of the higher magistrates, the consuls and praetors. So this definitely would apply to Nero. So in other words, the provocatio condition I just mentioned would apply equally to Nero. In fact, it didn't apply to lower magistrates. So the lower magistrates could never give a death penalty period because you're a Roman citizen, but the the only time it could apply is if a consul like Nero is deciding your fate and you get a penalty less than death and you want to appeal from him to the people of Rome. Now, that's an insult to the consul, isn't it, right? You're going to ask the people of Rome to overrule Nero, which is by Roman law can happen. Well, if you lose, now you can be killed. <laughs> See, that makes sense. <laughs> the consuls don't want to be embarrassed. So if you lose, you're going to be killed. So th- you're not going to do that kind of stupid <laughs> decision. Now, remember, uh, uh, what was his name? Sallust said the Porcian laws are another set of laws to look at. So let's take a look at the Porcian laws real quick. And this is, I'm just trying to rule out the possibility Paul could ever have been killed under Roman law. And you see why that's true. Porcian laws. There were three Roman Porcian laws broadening the rights of the Valerian law. They were enacted by members of the Gens Porcia in the 2nd century BC. We do not know the precise dates, but they seem to have ended summary execution of Roman citizens in the field and provinces. So you can't be killed in the field if you're a Roman citizen or in the provinces. And provided that citizens could escape sentences of death by voluntary exile. So you can never, if you 
If you thought you were going to be executed in Rome, all you got to do is say, I'm going to go to Spain. That's a province. You're, you're, not, you're not going to stay in Rome, the capital. That's an area where you can be killed if, if, you know, as a Roman citizen, theoretically. So get out of there. <laughs> this is what the Porcio Law allowed. Cicero, in his work called The Republic at 2.54, refers to three leges porcii, three porcii laws, but it's not clear of their specific details. Lex porcia number one. And it says, uh, perhaps it was proposed by the Tribune of the Plebs, P. Porcius Laica, in 199 BC. It extended the right to provocatio, meaning appealing to the people, to a, to a further 1,000 steps out of Rome, okay, uh, to Roman citizens in the provinces and to Roman soldiers. So in other words, you had the right not to be killed unless you appealed to the people of Rome. As long as you didn't do that, you're allowed to walk, walk 1,000 steps outside of the city of Rome. And you're free to do that and live and not be killed as long as you don't appeal to the people of Rome to overrule and embarrass the consul, right? Or you're a Roman citizen, you're living in the provinces. You can don't, don't have to appeal to provocati provocatio and you can accept a sentence less than death. But if you appeal and do your provocatio, you're going to provoke. It's a good reason. not The word provoke probably comes from this. If you're going to do your provocatio, you're going to provoke the, the uh, consul to be angry at you if the people of Rome don't agree with you in reverse Nero's decision, then you would be executable at that point, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, let's look at Lex Porcia number two, uh, proposed, potentially proposed by Porcius Cato, Cato the Elder, who was consul in 195 BC, extended the right to provocatio against flogging. And of course, Paul was able to get out of being flogged when the, that, be, that process was beginning. And he said, I, I'm a Roman citizen. And they stopped and they actually became alarmed and they stopped it and they gave him huge protection. And they t had 100, 400 horse troops and 200 regular troops to take him out to Caesarea. I mean, they were so worried that they could be a violent of the law because if you do anything to a Roman citizen, you would then be flogged or yourself executed. So this is very serious for the, 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 uh, the military men who are not Roman citizens. All right. Now, what really happened in Paul's case? It's right here in the Clement of Rome, first epistle, chapter five, verses five, six, and seven. Through envy. So now this is a uh, Hull's translation, 1885. And you need to know this epistle had been very popularly quoted a lot in the early church. And for some reason, it disappears when the Protestant Reformation begins, because if you read this, you would be embarrassed to say that Paul died uh, a martyr when he didn't according to this work. And what happened? This this work disappears all throughout the uh, empire and nobody knows where it is anymore. And yet it was so often quoted earlier, it's amazing how it disappeared when the Protestant Reformation came, but whatever, whatever can explain it, it did. But in 1626, the, the legate, uh, the ambassador, if you will, from Egypt brought an Alexandrinus Bible, that's the name of it, to uh, the King of England. This was the England of 1626, so it was the next king after King James. And this king accepted the Bible, it's, and it's one of the greatest Bibles of all time. It's 450 AD, approximately. And guess what? It was in the back at the final uh, page, after the final page of the Bible, there was the book, the, the Epistle of Clement. The original Epistle of Clement was sitting there all those centuries from 450 all the way to this time. And nobody noticed it until it was after it was delivered and it was then restored. But this had some unwelcome consequences. Read this. Through envy, Paul too showed by example the prize that is given to patience. Seven times he was cast into chains. He was banished. Now remember I told you exile is a way of avoiding death. So if he did get any sentence, all he had to do was get banished and he's fine. He won't get killed. He was stoned, having become a herald both in the East and the West. He obtained the noble renown due to his faith. Verse 7, and having preached righteousness to the whole world and having come to the extremity of the West, which I showed you the scholar quarrels, he says clearly that has to be Spain. And having been born be witness before rulers, he departed at length out of the world and went to the holy place, having become the greatest example of patience. Departing out of the world at length means you died a natural death. He did not die a martyrdom. He couldn't. He couldn't be killed. He just had to go to Spain and he would retire well. The other preposterous thing is all the phony accounts about Paul dying are all take place in Rome. Who is Clement of Rome? He's, he's the bishop of Rome. If anybody should know, this is written about uh, 67 AD, by the way. He, and Paul dies in 65, is 
Clement of Rome has to know that he didn't die, whether he died or didn't die at Rome. He has to. He's the Bishop of Rome, right? So it's beyond doubt that he didn't die a martyr at Rome. These are stories that you will see. They all are made up in the 300s. So the bottom line is, what does this all mean? Let's go all the way back now to take a look at the last line here. Now, what does this prove? All the stories about Paul dying a martyr are all from the late 300s. So what we have to conclude is this part of the work is modified and only at the very end. And you don't have to do anything but change a couple of lines and add a statement. But it doesn't say Paul, Apostle Paul, it just says Paul. And it doesn't say much of uh, anything except he, Nero Emperor, slew him by the sword with a sword. Impossible. Impossible. He couldn't have been killed ever because he's a Roman citizen. He's tied to the, the Herodian party. You cannot kill any member of that party. They're protected by law. And that's the end of that. And uh, even Nero couldn't transgress that boundary marker without himself being subject to censure and, and potentially execution himself by the <laughs> magistrates uh, because you've now rebelled against the Roman law. That just doesn't happen in Rome. They're all very centric on following the law, even uh, even Nero at this time. Uh, now, that doesn't mean Simon Kephas didn't get didn't killed in the city of Rome. Yes, that definitely happened because he is what? He is not a Roman citizen and he can be killed. Okay. Let's just look at the implication that Eusebius wrote most of this because obviously the accounts of all the uh, alleged ways that Paul died. There's four different conflicting stories. You know, cupbearer of Nero got offended and had Paul killed and, you know, some other offense and annoyance that Nero had, you know, for fl frivolous reason has P Paul killed. All these things, the, even the grounds that are provided are preposterous, okay? That's not how Roman law works. Anyway, um, so what do we see here? Paul is never mentioned as apostle in any of this account I just gave you. He is not mentioned to have actually been preaching in any of the places where you would think he would have been said to have been preaching because they're not crediting him with anything. This, therefore, reflects what we can see in the Dead Sea Scrolls is somebody who they don't trust and they don't even want to use his name. And literally, this is his only mention. And I don't believe this was a part of any part of the original text he's looking at. This is not the Ebionite document anymore. His name never appears in the Ebionite document that we read you earlier with those Roman numerals. Those have no mention of him and in fact exclude him and, and, and give principles that exclude him ever being a minister and being allowed to minister. So here is the only mention of him. And yet it should have been mentioned if he was, had any significance. So the, the silence is deafening is really what it is. And the minimalization of Paul is, is out, out, outstandingly clear. All right, so that's what's important about this uh, overall document. So this even corroborates what we've seen in the prior episode involving the portion that is clearly from the original apostles. This is a secondary work, which is actually probably Eus Eusebius himself telling history. And then after his death, likely someone made this change in here. And this ends up part of the history of in Edessa. Because again, you got to know this is found not in the 300s. This is found way into 1840. So this could be uh, amended, if you will, in the 380s to reflect the current story or some other way it gets changed to include this story that Paul died a, as a martyr. But he did not, unless you think First Clement is a corruption. And it can't be. It's not. It's, it's, uh, it has all the earmarks of truth. And by the way, in the same epistle, he says, Peter was executed as a martyr, and he says so, okay? So he doesn't use the same language at all with Paul, and we could go through that. Anyway, so I hope this helps everyone understand that the reaction to of the original church from the prior episode you can see was Paul is a nobody. They don't, they don't even mention him, and he's not involved in any of their missionary activities that they approved of, so he gets a zero blank. He's out, out completely. The only mention in the second part, which is Eusebius doing his historical work, is probably from someone who wrote it after Eusebius died. Eusebius didn't include this, and this is somebody else including it. That's what I'm saying. It's at the very end of his summary. So that, to me, is something to bear in mind. This is a story that only gets invented in the late 300s and early 400s. There's four different conflicting accounts. We've reviewed it previously. I have also have a detailed article with all these accounts, 
summarized, and I'll provide a link to that URL so you can take a look at it and make your own decision. God bless everybody. Take care. Ciao. Bye.